This is the official fasted training versus non-fasted training video. What I mean by that is we're gonna look at some of the science between what happens when you train in a completely fasted state, whether it's overnight or after an intermittent fast, or if you're training after eating some food. Okay, it's a common battle that's occurring on the internet. It's a common battle that people talk about all the time. Which is better? You get a little bit more power when you're training with a little bit more energy in your system, but you might get a better response if you're training in a fasted state. So let's look at the science, and there's one particular study that I wanna reference that's gonna break it all down and give us some clear-cut answers. But the first thing that I wanna talk about before we go into any detail on anything is I want you to stop worrying about if you're gonna lose muscle or not. Here's the thing. If you work out for long enough, if you work out for long periods of time, yeah, you're gonna burn up some muscle. But if you're training in a fasted state, the last thing I want you to worry about is losing muscle. Whether you're a man or woman, it doesn't matter. You're not gonna lose as much muscle as you think, if any. The fact is, you have way too many hormones that are skyrocketing when you're in a fasted state that far supersede the effects of catabolizing muscle. You have high amounts of human growth hormone that stop the breakdown of muscle. Okay? But the other thing is, once you've been fasted for a longer period of time, your liver starts to produce something known as BHB, beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is a ketone body. That ketone body stops what is called leucine breakdown or leucine oxidation. Leucine is an amino acid, and that amino acid is at the forefront of catabolism, muscle breakdown. It's very simple. If we have leucine in the equation, you're not breaking down muscle. If leucine is oxidizing, you're breaking down muscle. In the case of fasting, when you have ketones present from a fast, it doesn't mean you have to be in ketosis, it just means you've been fasted, you have enough of this overall ketone production to make it so that you're not going to burn up that muscle, you're not gonna go into that leucine oxidation. So now that that's out of the way, let's truly talk about the difference between training fasted and training fed. And there's one study in particular that really took a good look at this. It was published in the Journal of Physiology, and it took a look at something entirely different from what we're used to seeing. You see, normally, the argument for fasted cardio is really simple. It's kind of bro science, but kind of makes sense at the same time. People will say that fasted cardio is good simply because you're burning through all of your glycogen. Glycogen is your stored carbohydrates in your muscle. So they say that because you're training in a fasted state, you burn through that glycogen, and your body has no choice but to start burning fat because you've already gone through the glycogen. That's a simple theory and it kind of makes sense, but it's not the truth. That's not why fasted cardio is better. That's not how it works. So what this study looked at is it looked at something known as intramyocellular lipids. You see, inside of our muscles, we have little itty bitty teeny tiny bits of fat, okay? Intramyocellular lipids or intramyocellular triglycerides. These little fat molecules do things, okay? They trigger different responses, they actually get burned, they trigger different electrical signals, they do all kinds of things. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to take a look at what happens to these intramyocellular lipids when we train in a fasted state or in a non-fasted state. So this particular study took a look at individuals over a period of three weeks, and they had them train at 75% of their max intensity. In one instance, they had them train totally fasted after an overnight fast, not intermittent fasting, just overnight. And then in another occasion, they had them train with 150 grams of carbohydrates in the equation. And what they did is before and after each exercise session, they measured their intramyocellular lipid levels. And they did this through a muscle biopsy, which means they took a big hollow needle and they took out a chunk of their muscle, which sounds kind of disturbing and it sounds very painful, but that's how you do a biopsy and that's how you measure. Well, here's what they found. They found that the fasted group had a change of 18% intramyocellular lipids all the way down to 6%. Whenever they were training fasted, there was that reduction in fat droplets inside the muscle. Okay? Whereas the carbohydrate-fed group, the group that ate before doing any kind of cardio or ate before exercise, had zero change. Now, what does that mean? That means that these little itty-bitty microscopic fats that are inside our muscle get burned. They get moved into the blood and burned when we're fasted, but that doesn't happen when we're fed. Now, this gets even better, because what they found was that between the two groups, the level of glycogen that was used for energy was the exact same. This completely debunks that bro science myth about draining the glycogen and then burning fat. That's not how it works. We just proved that whether you're fasted or not, the carbohydrates that your body uses are the exact same. You use the same amount. You pull them from your muscles, and that's it. But the difference is that the fasted training allowed the utilization and the burning of those little microscopic fats inside the muscle. Now, you may be thinking, I don't feel like my muscles are fat. I want to get rid of my belly fat. I want to look a little bit better that way. 
Well, here's how it works. Those lipids that are inside your muscle went into the bloodstream and got burned. But those lipids have to be restored inside your muscle. They're naturally there. So the fact that we took them out of the muscle, put them in the bloodstream and burned them means that now your body needs to take fats from your belly fat and put it into the muscle so that it can go through that cycle again. So it's almost a natural process of fat burning and utilization whenever we're exercising. Now, the other thing that was really cool that the study found out was that those that were in a fasted state were able to replenish their glycogen at three times the rate of those that had carbs before their workout. What does that mean? It means that you can have up to three times more recovery than those that had carbs before their workout if you were fasting, simply because you had more insulin sensitivity. It means you were more receptive to the carbohydrates that you had after a workout and your body utilized them better rather than just turning them into fat. Now, at the end of all of this, it all has to do with one particular thing known as hormone-sensitive lipase. Now, I don't want to go too far down a rabbit hole because hormone-sensitive lipase is a very complex topic, but all we have to really know is that hormone-sensitive lipase is the only site in which the regulation of fatty acid oxidation can occur. Okay, if we don't have this particular thing called hormone-sensitive lipase, we essentially cannot burn fat during exercise. So we have little substations throughout our body. We have little hormone-sensitive lipase pockets throughout our body. And those are the places where fat burning occurs. So when we are in a fasted state, it's been shown that we have way more substations. We have more hormone-sensitive lipase. So that means the fat that is mobilized in our bloodstream has more places to burn, has more stations to burn. So instead of having five stations where your body can burn fat, you might have 50 or you might have 100. Obviously, this is a hypothetical example, but essentially, that's what we're looking at. And it all has to do with the fact that when we are fasting, we don't have insulin in the system. And it's not so much that we don't have insulin, but it's more so that when we don't have insulin, we have glucagon. So glucagon is the opposite of insulin. Glucagon has been shown in multiple studies to increase what is called phosphorylated HSL, hormone-sensitive lipase. So phosphorylated hormone-sensitive lipase is the form of hormone-sensitive lipase that actually allows fat burning. And I know I'm losing you right now because these are a lot of big words and I'm talking about a big storm, but all that simply means is that in the absence of food for short periods of time, we create more substations to burn more fat. Couple that with the intramyocellular lipids getting mobilized into the bloodstream and you have the perfect storm of your body being able to take fat from the muscle into the blood burned at the substation, and then have the cycle repeat. All without depleting your carbohydrate stores in any different way that you would if you were training fasted or non-fasted. So I hope that this clears some things up and gets rid of some of the bro science behind just draining the tank and then burning fat. That's very simple and a very juvenile way of looking at it. But if we look at the true science, it's even more fascinating. Now, as always, I'm here to give you the breakdown on fat burning. Anything that you need to know about the physiology of fat burning and the physiology of getting in the best possible shape, I'm your man. So make sure you let me know what kind of videos you wanna see in the comment section down below, and I will see you in the next video.